Uh, so, uh, good evening to everyone uh, or good morning, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Patrick and uh, I'm an ML developer at Coveo. And I really appreciate uh, this opportunity I have today to share some of the work we've done at Coveo uh, with everyone here. And uh, today I'll be talking about uh, blending product comparisons uh, with recommendations. Uh, and we'll get more into it uh, along the way. And here's just uh, some quick information about uh, Coveo. We are uh, as, uh, software as a service company uh, providing AI powered services in various uh, domains such as commerce uh, and service. And we are the leading uh, AI platform in, in Canada. And we have a global presence uh, in throughout the world in North America, Europe and uh, Australia as well. And before I begin, I'd also like to give thanks to uh, my collaborators, uh, Jacopo and Christine, uh, who like pretty much worked through with me uh, in, in this project. And so today I'll be talking about uh, comparisons as a, a type of recommendation. Uh, but first, uh, I think it's important to ask, you know, why is this even important? And I'm sure we all know that uh, e-commerce uh, has been a driving force uh, over the last couple of years. And in fact, uh, there's like little to no sign that uh, it is slowing down yet. And as a result, uh, you know, there's like a trend where even like traditional brick and mortar shops are uh, adopting or transitioning to e-commerce uh, to get online presence. Uh, the number of retailers available online is increasing and also like just because it's uh, you know a digital shop, uh, it's easy to expose uh, the full catalog uh, of products to consumers, and so now consumers uh, are faced with uh, a high number of products uh, av available to them. And uh, if you're familiar with the paradox of choice, uh, pretty much it, it points at um, how actually being presented with more options uh, makes decision making uh, more difficult. And for online shops, uh, you know, this is a pretty big uh, problem because uh, the decision making uh, of the consumers essentially drives uh, their revenues. And um, I think even more so, this is a problem uh, in an online setting uh, bec because uh, unlike traditional shops, uh, like the presence of, say, uh, shop uh, assistant is not available to guide uh, shoppers uh, through the sort of vast space of available products uh, available to them. And so one way in which uh, e-commerce uh, as, a, as a industry kind of tackles uh, this information overload is through recommender systems. And, you know, to say the least, uh, recommender systems are uh, ubiquitous and, you know, such as uh, being, you know, suggested like, oh, this is a similar product uh, as the, the current product that, that you're viewing. Um, but we think that retailers can go a step further and provide uh, even more comprehensive and meaningful recommendations, such as uh, in the form of a comparison table. And this allows for explicit comparison uh, over various dimensions, such as price and the various properties of the products. And I'm sure you can kind of guess uh, where the image uh, on the right uh, comes from, uh, but uh, I, I think it goes to show that uh, even the big players are uh, leveraging on, on these like comparison engines uh, in, in their shops. And the fact that uh, even for them, uh, they're not able to always get it right, uh, goes to show that um, this, this problem is, is, is non-trivial, uh, even if you have like, almost like full ownership of, of your data chain. So the question we set out to answer is, uh, can we, Coveo, um, offer this same experience uh, of a comparison engine uh, to mid-size shops? And as a multi-tenant SaaS company, uh, we're faced with unique challenges. Um, for one, uh, we have minimal control uh, over uh, the catalogs which we receive uh, from our clients. 
And uh, between clients, there, there's a, a wide gamut of quality. In addition, we operate in multiple verticals uh, of commerce, uh, such as fashion, uh, pet products, and home improvement. And it, the combination of these two factors uh, kind of puts us in a space where you know, we, we don't have a lot of uh, data to work with uh, that is uh, so-called uh, labeled or you know, supervised. And so for us, a good solution uh, would be one that makes as little assumption as possible about the data and also and, and, and therefore allows us to scale our solution uh, frictionlessly uh, across all our clients. So today I'll be walking you through our pipeline um, for generating these comparison tables, uh, as well as uh, sharing some of the design decisions uh, that we made and some of the insights that we had uh, through the experiments that we run. And first I'll be giving an overview of the pipeline uh, before going into more detail uh, about each stage. And at the end, I'll present you know, some of the experimental results uh, that, we, that we collected. And just like a, an overview, I guess, like in, in, in the generation of these uh, comparison tables, um, essentially what we aim to do is to present customers uh, with uh, what, what is called like substitutable products uh, in a, you know, economic terms. And, uh, you know, just, just a heads up, uh, because I'll be using like the term substitute product uh, a lot uh, in, in, in the coming slides. Yeah, and so now we take a look at the uh, pipeline, and I will walk you through it. So, you know, at the beginning, just you know, imagine uh, a shopper is currently viewing a fridge, for example. And what we do in our pipeline is first we perform a core search uh, using key nearest neighbors um, in order to retrieve a candidate set of substitute products. And you know, notice that like in this set, uh, there may also be um, non-substitute products such as like this shelf over here. And therefore, uh, you know, we want to use a neural network that we train to predict whether uh, pairs of products um, are substitutes or not, in order to refine the set. And once we refine the set. Uh, then we, we, we head over to uh, more of the product aspect uh, of the pipeline where um, you apply some heuristics in order to you know, determine which properties uh, that we want to display on, on our comparison table to, to choppers. And once we, we pick those properties, um, then we want to sample from the set of available uh, substitutes uh, you know, to construct a good representation uh, of the space of available products uh, to the shopper. So, you know, diving into the various stages, um, the first step we have the fast retrieval step uh, where we have this uh, product space, uh, which is which we build uh, in an unsupervised manner. And, you know, we, we there's more detail, uh, I think if I can share like the slides, uh, after the talk that you can uh, read up on. But essentially, um, we use the historical uh, shopper sessions uh, in order to give a uh, dense representation for each uh, product SKU. And we use Kenya's neighbors in this uh, product space to retrieve candidates. And by the kind of how, how, it, how it is trained, um, products uh, in this space are already very likely to be substitutes. But uh, at the same time, uh, we, we, we are aware that, you know, there, there's, there is, there are going to be like non substitutes in this step. Uh, but um, for us, the, the, the focus is on recall. And, you know, the fact that uh, this step is very cheap for us to compute. Uh, and therefore, we, we head over to the next step whereby we want to do like a more fine grain filtering where we take uh, this candidate set and use a neural network to predict whether uh, you know, the, the products are substitutes or not. But um, you know, I think in machine learning today, uh, it's fair to say that uh, you're only as good as your data. 
And as alluded to earlier, uh, we are sort of in a regime where uh, we do not have much uh, labeled data uh, available at, at our disposal. And so, you know, I'll, I'll be, you know, going into a bit more detail as to how we built uh, an unsupervised uh, data set for training this classifier. So it's, it's common in, in our domain uh, to utilize uh, co-occurrence data as a proxy uh, to, to label our data. In our case, uh, we want positive label uh, for items which are substitutes and a negative label for items which are not substitute. And here we see a typical shopping session uh, where this guy is you know, looking at running shoes uh, and then he starts looking at some uh, some pants, uh, and 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 after that, like sweaters, and along the way, he also adds uh, items to his uh, cart. And we extract uh, products which are viewed consecutively and call them, you know, co-view products, and use this as a proxy for products which uh, should be substitutes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we take sessions uh, with uh, with a purchase. And we look at the consecutive items that were added uh, to the cart. And we use these as a proxy for products which are not substitutes. So taking the, this co-view and co-purchase uh, co-occurrence data, we're able to form uh, you know, two sets of data, one positive, one negative, uh, where positive is, you know, examples uh, of pairs of products which are substitutes and negatives uh, are not substitutes. But I think it's uh, quick to, like easy to see that uh, noise can very easily be introduced into the data set, uh, where, for example, um, if two products that are viewed consecutively are not substitutes, and you know, based on the you know, previous example of the session, uh, if, if a shopper goes from looking at shoes to looking at shirts, uh, you know, th this sort of noise can be injected into, into the data. And so most prior work, uh, what they do is, you know, use count-based uh, methods to denoise the data set. For example, uh, to set a threshold to say that, okay, uh, I would only, you know, keep a pair uh, of products uh, within my data set uh, if they occur uh, or if they've been co-viewed or co-purchase uh, like ten times, and to also you know remove pairs of products which uh, occur in both the positive set and the negative set, uh, which uh, pretty much will, will be useless for for training. Um, but you know, following the idea that uh, you're only as good as your data, we we wanted to investigate further if we could do a better job uh, in this data preparation step. And so we added an additional step uh, to our data denoising. And the intuition uh, was that substitute products should a priori be visually similar. And you know, just in this example, uh, you know, a shoe should look more like a shoe than it does uh, to a pair of pants. Um, and so in order to capture uh, this like visual similarity, what we did was to use the cosine similarity between uh, pre-trained image vectors uh, that uh, you know were generated by yeah a pre-trained uh, convolutional network, and we we take this cosine similarity score as a proxy for visual similarity. In this case, you know, um, just like hypothetically speaking, the the shoe and the pair of pants has like cosine similarity of zero point three. And what we do is we set a threshold uh, to remove products which are not visually similar enough from the positive set and remove products from the negative set which are you know too visually similar. And on top of uh, data clinging, uh, we were interested in also uh, exploring data augmentation. And here the main idea is to exploit the transitive property of uh, substitutability uh, in order to generate uh, more synthetic uh, pairs of products. So to do this, first we form a graph um, from, from the positive uh, set of 
of pair of pair of products. And what we do is we we add an edge between products if they appear uh, in a positive set. And then we can basically find uh, disconnected subgraphs and kind of use these uh, subgraphs uh, as clusters of uh, substitu substitutable products. Then what we do is we take an original pair from, from the data set, such as like a positive one or a negative one, and replace one of the products uh, by sampling from its uh, corresponding uh, subgraph. And you know this allows us to create uh, synthetic pairs where uh, in this example, we replace you know, the, the pink pair of hands with uh, the black one, and here we replace the, the ASIC shoe with, uh, with the Nike one. And finally, um, we also need a way to represent our products uh, as an input to our neural network. So uh, we went with uh, dense representations uh, of our products. Uh, firstly, uh, what we call like Prochevec is the uh, product space, which we already trained uh, in the first step of the, of the pipeline. And we also uh, take the textual metadata and kind of use word to vec uh, to get a dense representation uh, for the name, category, uh, description. And so now, like, once we have all the data, uh, our model is fairly simple. Uh, it's just a, a Siamese network where for each product, we, have, we take the dense representations uh, and put it through uh, a fusion network, which will produce uh, uh, a single representation. And for each product, we take this uh, fused representation and pass it through uh, another network, which produces the binary classification score. And then, you know, like, you know, train, training training it with uh, the unsupervised data set, with back propagation, uh, that kind of thing. And so, you know, once we use our trained neural network and generate uh, our, you know, refined candidate set, uh, we come to sort of the, the, the last stage of our pipeline. And here we make uh, the main assumption about our data, which is that, um, you know, there exists some structured information about uh, the products and their properties. And while, you know, such information is not um, uniform, uh, across uh, different verticals. We, we find it to be more common in DIY and electronics where products uh, tend to be more technical. And for this step, we want to select properties uh, to display, which uh, would be important to shoppers. And to do this, we infer property importance uh, using a weighted combination of three factors. The first is uh, the number of times in which a property and its uh, values appear in search queries. The second is the number of, time, the number of times uh, the property and its attribute appear in the product page and product description. And the last is to look at the entropy of the property distribution, uh, which kind of kind of says uh, like how many products uh, or what's the variation in, in, in the property values uh, for, for the set of products. And so, uh, you know, one and two kind of measures uh, how important uh, the product, uh, sorry, the property is to shoppers. And three, looking at the entropy, uh, you know, allows us to bias the results to two properties, uh, at least with some, some variation uh, in that. And once we select uh, the properties which are important, um, we, we get to the final step where we want to select the products to actually display uh, on the comparison table. And here, the goal is to form a, a good representation of uh, what is available uh, you know, in, in the shop. And uh, to do this, we fix the price as one of the, di one of the dimensions that we want to vary. And to get a representative range of uh, price, we we split the price into different bins based on their log, on their log value. Um, 
And we sample three products, uh, one from the same bin as the, the query product, one from uh, a lower bin and one from a higher bin. So that, you know, this gives us, or gives the shopper uh, a spectrum of, of price ranges. And how we sample from these bins uh, is, 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 is done in a, in a greedy manner. And um, we, we basically uh, prefer variation in properties, which are not completely uniform or quasi-uniform uh, so that uh, we, we, we believe that th this allows us to uh, capture more, uh, more interesting uh, properties. And yeah, so like once we sample the products uh, from these bins, we are able to construct the final uh, comparison table. And this is pretty much uh, the end of the pipeline. And uh, so like now you might be wondering, uh, does, does all of this work? Um, so we, we, we ran several experiments. Um, one was to see how good the binary classifier was uh, and how much effect uh, the different um, like data cleaning and data augmentation steps we introduced uh, were. And we, we tested on two different shops. And here, our focus is mainly uh, on precision uh, because ultimately we, we, you know, uh, we, we don't want to like show shoppers uh, a product which is not a substitute or generate a compar comparison table which uh, has like non-substitutes uh, in there. And as a baseline, we take the cosine similarity of images uh, as the binary classification score. And what we found is that, you know, cleaning with the data, uh, sorry, cleaning the data with the image vectors uh, was, you know, the, the most uh, significant contributor to uh, the performance. And we can see this over here in, 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 the, in the PR curve for shop A, where, you know, over this region uh, of recall, uh, we see about like a seven to 10 point uh, increase in precision um, where, you know, these lines are, so the purple line is uh, the baseline and these other two lines are when we did not uh, perform a cleaning of the data. And whereas like these two lines on top uh, were, were when, when we did clean, uh, like the extra cleaning step. Um, but we also noticed that the performance boost kind of varies between shops. Uh, you can see here in shop A, shop B um, that there is still like an increase in, in, in performance, although uh, less pronounced. And, uh, you know, looking at the baseline performance for shop B, uh, which like uh, just to remind you is the cosine similarity of the pre-trained image vectors, it sort of like gives us a hint as to why uh, maybe we, we do not see such a significant boost uh, in performance. And we can kind of, like hypothesize uh, two possible reasons. Uh, first could be that, uh, you know, the assumption that we make about like a priori visual similarity does not really hold well for shot B, which is in the home improvement vertical. Or it's, it could also be that um, these pre-chain image vectors uh, are not as effective or fine-tuned to, to this uh, specific vertical, vertical and therefore, uh, our like uh, cleaning uh, cleaning step uh, is, is not as uh, effective. Um, another thing which we uh, wanted to like study or explore uh, was whether or not our our ranking of uh, property importance align aligned well with humans. So we ran a small user study on mechanical Turk. And the results generally show that uh, our algorithm has better agreement for uh, products um, which are more popular and common and less so for uh, extremely technical products like skis. Um, but it's interesting to note, uh, you know, here that like running shoes had the highest uh, uh, similarity in ranking. And 
you know, we believe that perhaps this is because uh, like running shoes is at an intersection where it is, you know, commonly known and therefore um, crowd workers are able to give good responses. And at the same time uh, has like properties which are technical enough uh, such that uh, there actually exists uh, a strong a strong order, ordering in, in, in these like property uh, importance. But uh, definitely we, we acknowledge that like this is still kind of preliminary uh, as a study and we're kind of looking forward to being able to test uh, this pipeline uh, in an online setting and, uh, you know, me me measure, uh, you know, uh, statistical uh, differences. And just to give uh, an example, uh, our real examples generated by our pipeline, uh, we, we built like a mock UI API and here you, we can see uh, like reasonable like proposals by our pipeline, which is completely uh, unsupervised. Uh, and yeah, like I think like looking at uh, these like ski boots, uh, I think we can appreciate how like for more technical products, uh, these uh, comparison tables can really help. And that kind of brings me uh, to, to like the end of uh, the pipeline overview and, um, you know, just like looking forward uh, into, you know, next steps. Uh, like I said, we're excited to perform uh, online experimentation uh, of this pipeline. We're also looking uh, as, a, as a team more in like human in the loop machine learning. Uh, and I guess with regards to like the binary model itself, I think kind of the results show that uh, there is some uh, room for some self-supervised uh, fine tuning uh, to different verticals as well. Yep, and you know, uh, if you're interested to find out more uh, about Caveo and uh, what we're doing uh, at the AI Labs, uh, we have a blog available. And we're also um, kind of like my colleagues have published extensively uh, in various conferences, academic conferences. Uh, actually, most recently, uh, they, they won uh, the best paper uh, in the industry track in, uh, at the Inaco 2021 conference. Uh, so I've added links for that. Uh, we're also hosting the Sigur Data Challenge this year. Uh, so if you're interested uh, in, a, in an e-commerce data set, um, yeah, do, do check it out. So yeah, uh, you know, thank you everyone for uh, listening, uh, and you know, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions uh, coming up. Thank you for your talk. Really great pipeline and uh, many great ideas that can I think can be used even for different topics, right? Just so like idea with uh, uh, disentangled graphs, right? Mm -hmm. And sampling from there. I already kind of like see it like happening for contrastive learning and like other things, right? Yeah, yeah. it's a pretty good idea. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so while people writing some questions, uh, I guess we have like a, a time for just like a few questions. Like one question is what you already kind of like mentioned, like at the end of your presentation, that um, the notion of similarity, right, is quite like heavily influencing what you're filtering out, right? Like how do you mine like positive and negative samples, like and everything else, right? How do you think like if suddenly you know you would like to extend it to have not only like exact visually similar, right, but I don't know, let's say like add style, right? Say I don't know, shoes like in the same styles, like fitting to like, you know, like item from other style, would it be kind of rewriting it from zero, right? Because, you know, like it's kind of like a changing completely like a notion of what's similar, what is not right an entire pipeline or how do you think about this one? Uh, so I think it is possible um, to do some like, I, sorry, like just to clarify like your question, are you saying that like maybe this person is like looking at boots uh, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, like like maybe like high boots, although like he only wants to look at like, you know, like high Exactly, yeah, yeah. So you have, I don't know, some like a style, I don't know, smart casual, for example, right? Or classic, right? And you would like to see the items that belongs to a different categories, right? But they still have like this notion of similarities that 
oh. are similar. You know what I mean? So it's not really shoes that look exactly the same, right? But basically something that for the human is similar, right? But for your approach is going to be completely like, you know, orthogonal to each other, right? Oh, okay. So do you mean similar like style, like, yeah. you know, like the whole like outfit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, de definitely. I think like uh, our pipeline uh, doesn't it isn't really like targeted uh, towards this. Uh, like I, I do agree. Like that is uh, sort of like a different form of like recommendation uh, that we are also seeing uh, where um, like shops are proposing that like oh if you buy this you can kind of like match it with like these. Uh, Combine with something else. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I think that there are some work uh, which try to tackle this like. Yeah, stylistic uh, similarity. Nice, nice. And another question. So you, I guess you mentioned it like with the furniture, right? I'm not sure uh, if you uh, validate it like with the backgrounds, right? Because I can imagine for like many of uh, very fashion items, right? They like always. I mean, most of the time is gonna have like very wide backgrounds, right? And you're only picking up like this similarity of the item itself, right? And for furniture, in many cases, it's going to be like more surrounding of the room, right? Did you consider the kind of like this one to be like a factor of uh, what your uh, feature extractor from uh, image side going to be picking up like on those images? Because it's going to be like a bit in mm -hmm. related, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think like in the domain of like fashion, like like most of the times the, the images are already like very clean uh, and like, you know, like the form factor of a shirt uh, can't vary that much, but uh, like if, if you look like at a table, it, 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 there there are like a wide range of like possible like configurations uh, mm. to 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 kind of like have an image for for a table or like a shelf, and so I think uh, for I think for for these like verticals, uh, it's worth like exploring. Uh, some like self-supervised methods uh, to fine tune uh, where, like I think you alluded to like, you know, contrastive learning, that kind of thing yeah. where, uh, you know, I think there's some work uh, in the past year where you you, you kind of only need like positive sample uh, and, you know, rely on like data augmentation uh, in order mm -hmm. to kind of build better rep representations. Uh, 